Today I'm going to talk about a journey of a home-based personal cloud project. So this is a very personal project, so I would like to start from the start. Uh, it was in 20 um, 2007 when um, I was in high school and we were on a weekend with uh, my dad and we were bored and we were looking for something to do and I've heard about this little thing called Ubuntu. And I decided to, uh, there were uh, an event at Paris uh, that was called Ubuntu Party. So we decided to go. And it was a full day of conference around um, free software and it changed my mind. I, I to this day, I knew what I wanted to do. Then later, later that year, I the green of the of the moment was to um, uh, became true. We went road tripping to the United States, and um, this was my very first trip overseas. So you can see, this is me. <laughs> we can change in 17 years. And 17 years later, here we are, here, um, at the same place in Los Angeles. Um, I would like to share my experience about um, running a project uh, entirely on free and open source uh, software without based on the idea that we don't need to depend on cloud provider to hold our own data. From the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank the organizer for selecting my talk because this means a lot to me. So who am I? Now, my name is Julian Ryu, and I'm an open source DBA. You can find my previous talks on this website, and if you want to see the slide and click on the links, you can already open it. Uh, they are uh, available, and you can follow me on Mastodon. Um, today we are going to talk about why, uh, the context of the project, and the history, the, the timeline. We will talk about infrastructure, data management, uh, alerting, observ observability, automation, and what's next. And I will give you a little takeaway. So why? Why running a home-based personal cloud storage? Why on earth? Because I want, I never, I, I've lost data in the past, and I want it to never occur again. Uh, and I also want to control my data. Uh, as you can uh, heard, I'm French, so I don't want to provide my data uh, anywhere in the world. I want to keep it with me. And I also wanted to learn new stuff, so a lot of solutions I've um, implemented maybe are already solved by uh, one tool or something. I just wanted to try some tool one by one and have some fun. A little bit about the history. It was in 2013, 2013, uh, I was living in an apartment and my data was stored on USB drives, classic. But the USB drives are uh, hard to find. Maybe they are lying around uh, somewhere and we used NTFS because at that time we had some Microsoft Windows uh, laptops uh, that were unable to open uh, like XT3 or 4 uh, file system. We had to physically plug and unplug the disk and eject uh, the, the disk before, uh, um, before the end or something bad happens. So I decided to look for some NAS, the network stage storage, like this type of NAS. I didn't bought this, this one, but for the illustration. So I used my desktop uh, PC to create a NAS. Uh, it was on my home office with some, some bash shares because of Windows, and, but there is, a big problem. Every time I upgraded this the server, uh, the client were unable to to reach the shares. 
it was a big problem for me. And in 2015, I got a new job at a major cloud provider in Europe. Ironic, huh? <laughs> uh, but this gives me the, the um, advantage to have a discount price on disk, which is not the case anymore. They don't provide us disk anymore because, you know, safety reasons. But at the time, it was um, available. So I decided at work, we also use OpenZFS. So I discovered at that time OpenZFS, more on that later, that we were well, uh, uh, able to create NFS and CIFS shared. And I use GNU Linux and uh, on servers and desktop at work. So it brings me back to, 20, uh, to 2007 when I discovered the open source world. So I decided to create a small storage with all this hardware that could buy it uh, uh, at this discount price. So it must be silent and small because I live in an apartment at that time. It has to, to have the same design as the uh, NAS I've shown pre before, so very small, like Synology, if you know this, uh, this brand. I bought three uh, hard drive of four terabytes. It was well pretty cheap at the time. Used drives, so they were four years old when I, I plugged them, but it's okay, they work. And I decided to buy new stuff, uh, new hardware like Intel NUC motherboard and PCI red card because there were not enough uh, SATA ports on the motherboard. And I decided to try FreeBSD because on FreeBSD, OpenZFS is support is built in. But I made a mistake. When I bought the motherboard, it wasn't on the uh, right format. I, um, there was mini ETX and micro ITX. They are supposed to be small, but they are not the same. So it ended up like this. <laughs> I had the motherboard outside of the case. The monitor is my uh, my TV, and it is on um, where we watch TV. It's not on my office, so <laughs> it can uh, give you the vibe at the time of uh, what I was able to do. Anyway, uh, I've set up some things on Frankenstein PC, and uh, okay, let's start to copy some data and a big sound noise started to ring inside uh, the, the, the room. Uh, later, I found out that b it was because of the temper temperature. Uh, when it was higher enough, there is a buzzer inside the case that were uh, causing this, uh, this sound. So anyway, uh, I have something I can't use, so let's buy new hardware. I decided to buy something I know, so a classi classic ATX tower with new hard drive, smaller ones to reduce the price because I don't need that much of storage. So I decided to, and I've already bought some parts before and still use FreeBSD. And in, and in 2018, I had a baby. So I had to put the computer away of my home office to create a room for the baby. And I didn't have any time more to do this stuff. And one year later, I got a house, a new house, my house with more, more space. Uh, noise is not an issue anymore because we have a basement and a secure basement behind um, like a regular ha house. And I have a third PC, an old storage, um, because I reused my main computer as a storage. It was my very first PC I vented in two twenty eight, uh, 2008. It only had three uh, hard drive of one terabyte. Three is a good number. You will see later why but I already had them somewhere. But this one had some issues. Um, 
for the installation, the USB stick didn't work. So I had to burn a CD-ROM on the latest version of FreeBSD at that time that was causing um, a Lua error. You can click on the link, the bug uh, was open. I tried FreeBSD 11, same error. Uh, after two, uh, two or three CDs be uh, burnt, I decided to fall back to Debian and it worked. But after that, uh, and running for some time, the PC uh, freeze, freezes, so I had to hard reboot it from time to time. So I decided to fully replace that later on and upgrade it too with more hard drive a few years later. So quick recap, today I have three servers. Um, they are not named uh, chronologically because uh, of all this history. Uh, they are pretty much the same capacity except the first one that is a very big one, but it's enough. And I decided to f use Debian only because at the end of the presentation you will see that I uh, use automation and it was hard for me to manage two operating systems at the same time. I had to choose and Debian has a pretty nice support of uh, OpenZFS. But I had computers everywhere. What should I do with them? Um, I need to find somewhere to put them and to be useful because I don't need free PC uh, to run uh, storage. So the idea is to put one computer at my dad's house and my parents-in-law house and at my house. I have a distributed storage system. And as you can see, we have one server in France and two servers in Belgium all in different houses, all in the basement. A little word about the clients, because now I'm not the only one using this, um, this uh, solution, this infrastructure. Uh, there are my parents too. So I decided to convert the Windows uh, uh, clients, the Windows uh, computer they had, with something very similar. Uh, I decided to use Kubuntu, which is Ubuntu with KDE interface because it looks like Windows. And so they are not very lost. And in the end, they only use the browser, so it doesn't matter for them. But it was better for me to do the maintenance. And I decided to use uh, NFS, Network File System. Uh, it's easy to set up with a full uh, Linux environment or even BSD environment. It's easy to maintain and it doesn't break uh, when you upgrade. Um, so the idea is to mount a remote directory but locally on your client. So you can copy file without worrying about local storage. But it's not that user friendly, especially for the parents. So I decided to, and my dad in, in reality has a new uh, PC with Linux. He kept the old Windows PC and he kind of have both systems at the same time to make the switch eventually one day. So I had to find a solution even for Windows. That's why I use, I choose C file. Just, I just picked this one because it's written in Python, uh, not in PHP. And at that time I was installing um, directly on the host without Docker uh, system or something like that. But right now I use Docker, so I could use any solution out there. But it turns out C file is pretty, it's, it's okay, it works. Uh, it's user friendly, there is a, a drive client. You can uh, mount uh, as, a, as a drive. Uh, there is a web UI, so you can even share links on a, on a UI, on, a, on, on a, um, a web link. If you are not uh, inside your house, you can uh, share something to the family, for example, and it keeps file in sync. There are different levels of caching, but uh, you can read the docs because I'm not an expert in different modes. Sorry. 
One big issue is connectivity. How can we connect all three host together because I want in the end to copy the data from one host to another. First, a static IP address. You should know that in Belgium to have a static IP address on a major uh, ISP, it costs $30 per month only for one static IP address. It's horribly expensive. I don't want to spend 30 um, euros per month so that's not an option and ISP modem settings uh, I have three houses with different ISP settings if we can take only mine uh, it allows only few protocols by default you have to do port mapping and you even have to do to request the ISP to lower the security level. And it works at my apartment, but not in my, at my house. So not an option. What can we do? I decided to use OpenVPN. Uh, it's a virtual private network solution, a VPN with a client server model. Uh, it can authenticate with certificates using encryption, like TLS, and it allows clients to communicate with, with each other. And it can even assign static IP address to the client, so the storage server. And here is the setting. You have the topology, which you declare a subnet. Uh, you allow client to client. You can define the static IP address and the, the pool. Okay, but I kind of lie to you. I had to use something external to configure this uh, VPN. So I have to rent uh, a VPS somewhere. Uh, in that case, it's at my own company, but I don't have any uh, discount on that, but I could use no, uh, every uh, VPS uh, of, uh, uh, in the world, uh, the cheapest one could work. You only need a network and a static IP address, of course. And the, the, the network is encrypted, so you don't care they can't sniff or something. And the certificate authority is at my house. So it's pretty secure. And it goes like this. Um, all the network flows transit via the VPS. So you should uh, select a location that is close to your clients. That's why I use a VPS in France because it's the closest location I could choose. So it, it was working. Now the servers can communicate with, it, uh, with each other. And for that, we can configure SSH to remote uh, control them. So from my house, I can control everything. Now, let's talk about data management. As I said multiple times before, I choose OpenDFS for Zettabyte file system. Uh, Zettabyte is stands for uh, the number of uh, grain of sand on Earth. But this file system can handle more bytes than that. So it gives you the idea of the powerful system uh, of DFS. It can manage your disk, create some redundancy with a RAID. You can create multiple file systems. Um, you can create snapshots for uh, implementing a, a backup solution. And the snapshots are, are basically free. It's a copy and write system, so there is no impact as I can have seen with LVM, for example. When you take a snapshot with LVM, there are, back in the days, there were a lot of IO operation. With DFS, there is no little to no impact. And with those snapshots, you can do replication, cloning, and even rollback on the data. There are built-in features with uh, DFS, like compression, uh, it's transparent 
and encryption and it's production ready. Even on Linux, uh, at my work, every backups are on OpenDFS. It's like 600 terabytes of data and it's for databases. So yeah, production ready, even on Linux. But here we are at home though, so it could be easily okay. So red, in DFS it's more like a red Z. Uh, there are multiple level of red. You can um, do the standard red, but I choose a red Z with three disks. A you have a parity disk and you can lose up to one disk. So if you lose one disk, you can replace it and uh, re-silver re the data. It's DFS can handle that for you. And then uh, you can list uh, the pool. Here I have uh, like six terabytes of data available on, uh, on three disks and uh, a little less, five and, uh, and a half, thanks to the parity. And I use pretty much 50% snapshot included. And I, ke I keep 10 years of snapshot. And this project is less than 10 years, but I won't reach the maximum. Maybe in a few years, but uh, not right now. And I can enable the compression. So for uh, binary data, it's not that important, but if you have documents, for example, like uh, text files or uh, um, thesis or something like this, the it, it can be compressed uh, very well. And you can create file systems. So you can create, for example, for my example, I've created one file system per person. So everybody has its own uh, space, but you can do whatever you want. I even have one file system for uh, one software, for example. And you can mount this file system directly using DFS itself. And you can create snapshots. So the data, for example, if I need to access the data in the middle, I can clone the snapshot on a main point and directly access and even modify the data without touching the snapshot. It's pretty magical. And you can replicate the snapshot. You can replicate the first snapshot by piping through SSH. And you can do incremental uh, send uh, with the previous snapshot as a base uh, snapshot. But as you can see, it could be a little bit complicated at the end. So I use the snapshot management um, system called Sanoid, which is open source. Uh, it can take snapshot for you, run pre and post snapshot scripts. If you, for example, run a database and you have to do some op operation before, uh, the fun fact about this feature is uh, I contributed myself to implement this feature because when I discovered this uh, solution, this Sanoid solution, I decided to use on in um, on my home lab and it was so better than wha what we used before at my company that we decidi decided to use it at our company. And you can prune, uh, so remove uh, older snapshot, all based on policies. And you have monitoring capacity. You can check if your ZFS pools are okay, or healthy, or if you run out of capacity. The configuration is like a, a mini file. Uh, you have here two templates. You can say the number of snapshot based on the how uh, the, the the frequency like hourly snapshot daily monthly yearly and if you want to create snapshots and prune snapshots based on on that and i use this uh, I, I keep 10 years of snapshot with um one years uh, in in monthly snapshot and uh, one um, uh, 31 so one month every for every day snapshot and I have uh, a template archive for s managing the replicated snapshot. So they can't create other snapshot where they shouldn't. So I have two templates and uh, 
I deploy the one I want where I want. And the policies, you use the template defined before, so you can use one template or another example. And by default, Sanoid comes on under Debian with um, systemd services service that is called with a timer, and this timer is like cron a cron job, um, and the service is like a one shot um, command. So here is by default. It's by default it's cheap uh, like this, and there is a timer that runs every 15 minutes. It doesn't mean that a snapshot will be created in uh, 15 minutes, only the configuration will be evaluated in 15 minutes, so it can run all the time. Only needed snapshot will be created based on the, the date and time. And if we uh, play with uh, some timers, we can see the next time the command will be executed. And Um, Sanoid comes with another tool that is useful, it's Syncoid. So there are two binaries in Sanoid uh, um, repository. Syncoid is like rsync, but for uh, ZFS snapshot. You can see it like that. Uh, it can resume on interruption, because you know a network can fail. And it can control the bandwidth. Uh, I have a pretty small, a pretty low bandwidth at home, and I don't want to uh, make some noise um, and um, uh, interrupt the work when I'm working or uh, slow down the TV for the kids or something, even if it's bad. <laughs> but you can control the bandwidth, especially the upload bandwidth. So the usage. It's like our sync, pretty much the same same option. Not not the same option, but the same principle. I've added some uh, a list of commands to the script, and with the same um, idea as sync as Anoid, I've created a, a system D service and a timer. So every configuration is available here if you want to uh, on my website if you want to check this out later. And one nice feature here is the um, randomized delay a second. For example, I don't want my house to uh, overlap with some other house, so I prefer to delay the starting and with a random value. So the timer are uh, capable of this, can do this. So it goes like this, uh, the local client, client connect to the local storage and the storage overnight send a snapshot to the two other storage. Beware, you should not do multi-master or multi-primary replication. Um, it's only to the two nodes. There is no uh, circle. Here, um, the colors do don't overlap. It's like a, a circle if you take the pic big picture, but if you zoom, only one host will send to the two others. And Sanoid is able to, to check the health of your system and the capacity. So now I need to be aware when something goes wrong. So let's implement some alerting. I decided to use the good old Magios it can be old and ugly, but it's light and it works. It, um, it can be configured with a simple configuration file. We have a simple infrastructure, it's okay. Uh, it has a web UI. If we want to, for example, uh, put some downtimes because we are doing some stuff and we don't want to be alerted, like a real uh, enterprise, um, or or not, if you don't want to use the web UI, it's okay. And there are a lot of plugins. And welcome to Pilot. It's like a pilot, uh, but in French. Um, it's a Raspberry Pi, uh, a small host. I had some Raspberry Pi 
uh, somewhere so I decided to took one to take one and to install it to have my own Negios at, uh, Negios at home. Negios has multiple components uh, it can declare hosts, host groups to regroup multiple hosts and services uh, to link services to host groups and notifications. So the pilot is now about uh, able to run check commands to different hosts and for that um, there are here multiple host groups uh, there are monitoring servers for the, the monitoring server itself there are storage servers for the host group and one host here with a name so we can declare our host it's a host name and IP address simple we can define the host groups so you comma separated list of hosts and we can define multiple service command the one I use there are three commands I use one is check ping to ensure the host is alive the check an, an RP which a remote uh, plugin executor for Nagios and check HTTP for the web services. Uh, there are multiple service states. Okay, warning, critical, and non. You can define, um, you can, based on the services uh, level, uh, you, you can define the alerting uh, later. If you want to be alerted for a warning, for example, or only critical. And the service configuration goes like this. We have a host group name, so we attach the service to host groups. And we name the service, of course. And we have one command, check an RPU, with some argument. Here, check ZFS snapshot to tell the NRP uh, local agent on the host, OK, ex execute uh, me this command and uh, send me back your result. And the NRP agent is deployed on every storage server and it runs the command um, on the host. And for the notifications, I'm a big fan of Telegram. I use it every day. So I decided to implement a notification system for Nagios. It's open source. You, you can click, you, you will uh, go on a repo and it can be configured. You can uh, have it you it's written in Python and it uses Jinja for the template so you can basically put whatever you want into the, the template and you have notification like this so here I, I have a problem on my snapshot one snapshot is too old so it means that the the overnight transfer has failed so I can check it out but I'm not on call I will check it out later when I have time it's a home-based project. I don't want to, to be uh, a, s a, a slave of <laughs> my uh, infrastructure. I'm already one at, uh, at work. I don't want to have work at home. And a recovery uh, co uh, notification, same. And we have the web UI, but there's one issue. The web UI is available only locally. How can we make it? available to the world, for example, if I'm not at my house, I would like to access the web UI. For that, I've set up Nginx on the VPS that run the um, OpenVPN uh, server. And the Nginx acts as a reverse proxy. So it terminates the SSL uh, connection and communicate via the VPN over HTTP which is insecure, but the VPN itself is secure and it's only monitoring system with, uh, and it's also already in place. So the web UI goes like this. Everything is green, but it's not always the time. That's why we have uh, set up uh, an infra I have set up an infrastructure like this. Okay, we have the live system uh, alerts. What if we want to know the evolution of the system? What do you want if we want to put some observability in there? So I want to know the display evolution. It's good to know 
the network stability because I had some stability issues on my over my network and I wanted to know where is it is, is uh, the, the origin of the issue. And the most important here was the temperature, like the buzzer before. I don't want this to happen again. And the power consumption, because my dad wants to save money uh, and it's kind of scary to let a computer run 24-7. <laughs> so he wants to know how much will it cost. So let, let's do this. For that, I use what's called the TIG TIG stack. It may not be the most latest uh, technology here, but at that time that was pretty common. So uh, TIG is for Telegraph, InfluxDB, and Grafana. Telegraph is a plugin that collects metrics locally and sends them to a data store, a, a, a metrics data store. So it gathers some inputs, like the CPU, like disk I.O., uh, and other stuff, um, and write to some outputs. Here, the InfluxDB. Uh, InfluxDB is like uh, a real-time um, data analytics database. Okay, it's all the solutions are in the open. And the last one is Grafana, is like a tool that allows you to create dashboard and visualize your data. And my dashboard look like looks like this. I have the disk evolution. I have, let's say, the, the, the capacity, the fragmentation, all the ZFS stuff here. Uh, I have some disk temperature, the age of the disk, eight years. I should I should uh, watch them, but uh, they, they don't fail. And the different colors is because I have reinstalled the server at the time. A little overview of the infrastructure of the Observer VT1. Um, I decided to use my monitoring server to install InfluxDB and other stack, but at some point the SD card wasn't crashing so much. So I decided to use a real server that I also use for other uh, projects. Um, so now I have real SSDs, and but I don't have so much metrics, but I don't want my uh, host to reinstall my host uh, every uh, for a once in a while. So I have deployed a new server that runs Docker image images of InfluxDB and Grafana and I also use the same technique to access the uh, web interface with a reverse proxy with a Nginx. So we have a lot of things going through the VPS. Unfortunately, if I had static IP address and a way to, to do something uh, at home, I won't require and I will be 100% free from a cloud provider. So Docker images are available. Um, but in the end, uh, if I would like to start from today, I would replace this uh, metrics collection with uh, a Prometheus-based um, solution. Uh, I will learn new things, and this is also the goal of, of this project. And then sensors. I want to know the temperature, the humidity, and even the noise of where the storage of our, 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 our place of my basement. And for that, I decided to use Arduino. Uh, it's powered by USB, so you have just to plug it on your computer, do some electric stuff with pretty cheap sensor. It costs, uh, it's very cheap. I don't know the exact cost, but it's way cheaper than all the stuff that I've already bought before and it works with a breadboard and some electric cables. So, so the archi architecture is like this. You have a breadboard here, some cables, you, you can plug them and it goes through, they go through the sensors and you will have to put some code into the board, 
run it and gather the data. So the software, there is an IDE for Arduino when you can write code and push what's called a sketch. You can upload it to the board and let it run forever. So here is the code. You can initialize some values for humidity, temperature, and sound. And if you want to have more um, sensors, you can update the code. You have a setup function. For example, the sensors are uh, OK after two seconds of wait before the values are uh, not uh, not okay so you can wait here wait wait here initialize some stuff then you have a main loop so the delay is more in the main loop main loop here you you define the initial initialization part the main loop is the loop that runs all the time and i ga and gather with the module some uh, metrics and format the metrics with the format you want but there is a problem with that. Um, if you use one process, it's okay. But as soon as you use two or more process to access the serial in, in interface, you will have uh, access issues. So for that, you should use multiplexing. And it kind of, uh, I it's more in uh, the, you, you often see uh, the mosquito part the the broker when you have independent systems uh, writing to uh, one uh, centralized system, but here the the concurrency is only on Nagios from one part and Telegraph from the other part. So we have to use a multiplexing system. So we I use the MQTT broker called Mosquito. I've created a tool that's called serial to MQTT to gather the value and send them to this middle queue. And I use the check that was already existing, check MQTT, and the Telegraph plugin already has a, a, a consumer of MQTT. So a diagram goes like this. There is the sensor going to serial to MQTT to Mosquito and Nagios and uh, the metrics could read from the queue and have the same data and for doing what they are supposed to do. So the graph goes like this. As you can see, the temperature is okay. The threshold is like 25 degrees. I don't know how, how much is in Fahrenheit, sorry. <laughs> you can search 25 degrees, it's pretty warm, but it's okay. Um, the buzzer sound was triggered at 29, so way over. So it's pretty cool in my basement, even in the summer. It's one year of data, and we can see the summer is here, and the winter is here. So we are, we are okay. What about humidity? Oh, humidity is pretty high, like 90%, but we don't care. I, it doesn't affect the system, uh, there is no, um, the, the, the hardware looks pretty good, it's pretty new, and with the temperature, uh, even in summer, the, we, the humidity is not a problem. Not At least not at home where I live. And the noise. What about the noise? <laughs> I can't even know when, what does that mean. In reality, the sensor is activated when you tap on it you have spikes, but only when you tap on it. If you have ambient uh, noise, you won't even detect. So I was confused. I decided not to look at it because the, uh, the noise is not a problem anymore in the basement. And what about power consumption? How much will it cost? For those you don't know, the Belgium price of electricity has spiked over the last years. Uh, it was like four times the price we used we had before the COVID, but I it's it's two times now, but it's pretty expensive. And those are the price of Belgium here. It's the fourth 
uh, top expensive uh, given to this um, statistics and France is over here. So we have not cheap electricity. First, I decided to want to use the watt meter. You can plug it on the wall and see how many watts do, uh, do you consume, but uh, how to parse the data because uh, they are cheap. But you, unless you put a camera and analyze with AI, I don't know, but <laughs> it's pretty hard to implement. So I decided to use a new PS. Uh, the UPS is, little, is a little bit pricey, more than 100 bucks, 150 bucks. But this is a project I want to, to, to be happy, so I decided to buy them and to work with them with something called APC UPS daemon, which is a daemon for this kind of UPS. There is a Telegraph plugin also. And uh, the graph and dashboard is already available. And the nice little thing is, is now I can save my servers from power outage. <laughs> that was not the first purpose, but it's, it's nice to have now. And the dashboard is here. You can see the evolution of the power consumption thanks to the battery and it costs only $7 a year. Even for an expensive um, country as Belgium, $7 per year. Not even the price of a kebab. So in real life, there are some photos. Um, this is the Eiffel Tower, but the, the server is in Belgium. <laughs> But just because I'm from Paris, but I live in Belgium now. And you have, th this is my fridge, and this is the wall. So there is a little space here, and it's cool, it's uh, okay, it doesn't take so much space. And you have this Frankenstein electricity thing over there, but it works. <laughs> uh, generally, the kids don't go here so it doesn't fail. Uh, or they can go just before on the fridge and they won't touch it, so it's okay. It's the basement. They don't usually go to the basement. And at my dad's house, it's the same principle. And in my in-law's house, same. The fridge, the wall. <laughs> okay, now, I uh, will try to go a little faster. Uh, let's talk about automation. Because failure, we already have saved our data, okay? But some failures can happen. You can have micro SD card that fail, or flood of fire in the house. Oh, it can happen. So for that, my workflow of deployments goes like this. I inside the operating system, uh, install and configure the software, and restore the data. Or for a new server, it's optional, of course. And we will focus here on install and configure the, the data, the software. And for that, I use Ansible, which is an open source, um, uh, simple IT automation system. I and by simple, it's really simple. It's written in YAML but not the same YAML as you have in Kubernetes. It's really simple YAML. And the concept, you have an inventory. The inventory here is a group of hosts. And uh, because I don't have a lot of hosts, I use static files. And a playbook. Playbook uh, uses some roles uh, that group some tasks. And tasks are modules plus uh, arguments. So the inventory example is like this. You have a name and eventually an IP address. Because I didn't, I don't have set up a DNS server, uh, I just put the IP address because it's static over the VPN, no change. Even if I move from anywhere in the world, the IP address will stay the same as soon as you have uh, an internet connection. And my playbook looks like this. You have 
a site.yaml, which is a best practice when you have to configure an infrastructure. And I have multiple playbooks to uh, configure multiple parts of my infrastructure. I have storage server, but I also have other servers that I won't cover here. I decided to write my own roles like the like the um, the previous talk just for fun same uh, as you <laughs> so i decided to use a common role uh, for storage a zfs role an open VP vpn role and inside the playbook you can have optional um, roles for example the you can target some sub host into your inventory and in this example, I deploy only the NFS server on the storage one because I'm the only geek that uses the in NFS server at home, so I want it to de be deployed only on this host. And a role uh, is like this. You, you have uh, your default variables, uh, your handlers to act eventually on services, like restart some services if needed. Like you have your task and your template. Some modules I use, the uh, I use the built-in modules of Ansible, like APT to install packages, like files to manage files, services, and templates. Templates to create the uh, files based on uh, Jinja, Jinja templates with variables, loops, and so and so. So I use a template to manage my Syncoid uh, destination script, as I've shown before. And this is the, the template. It's a Jinja template. You have like uh, brackets here for uh, every data set in the main data set. I do a double loop with the destinations and I do a little echo for the log and I call the, the same command uh, as I've shown before, but templated. And it creates a file, shortened for the, 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 the talk, but uh, there are multiple lines, and I just need to configure variables to tell the, le, the list of data sets and the destination. And Ansible will do the rest for me, without any copy pass issue. And for upgrades, I use not a role, but a task. I've created a task, apt upgrade, that calls a module apt to upgrade. And I run it with a CLI, uh, Ansible playbook. You can run for the whole infrastructure, sit.yaml, uh, or the upgrade. And you can use this uh, as a basic, uh, building blocks for the rest of uh, potential infrastructure, like at work, but at home. So what's next? I should open source my Ansible code base, but right now I can't because I've put some secrets in there. So I don't want to share my secrets. So I have to remove my secrets, my variables, and put that online. So I will, I will do that very shortly, uh, I promise, uh, because it could be a good example of what I managed. Uh, at home. So there is something that I uh, wanted to do. It's automate certificate man management for renew my uh, certificates for the VPNs. Uh, I, uh, I have monitoring on the date, but I don't renew them with the automation. I do it by hand. Uh, I probably should use ZFS encryption because, okay, your house is safe, but uh, you can be broken by some thief. So but I'm not sure they will pick my server first, but we don't, we don't know. So encryption is good. You should encrypt uh, by default. And use Prometheus for metrics. I should probably forward some logs because it's good to have logs at one uh, location instead of going on every host. And the more important is to handle the mobile phones. Because today we take a lot of pictures, for example, with our mobile phones. And right now the solution is not pretty well designed for that. The client for C file is not very working well. So I should fix uh, this issue. 
Okay, so the takeaway is uh, self-hosting is not that hard. As you can see, a free server for free house. Um, even if I've done it through the years, it was on my free time with kids, so it's okay, you can do this. And I, I'm not burned out, so you can take your time, but it's not that hard. Uh, but if you really want something fast, you should consider using a built-in solution like TrueNAS. There are a lot of features uh, that I've shown that probably are handled by TrueNAS, and free and open source software is awesome. This is my philosophy. I try to contribute contribute as much as you can. I even have a Postgres ruby, so this is in my blood. And enjoy what you are doing, because if you don't, what's the point? I would like to thank you for being here. Uh, it's uh, uh, you are a lot here, so it's mean a lot to me. And uh, thank you. If you have questions. Maybe just a little one or two questions because I've been running late, so yeah. Yes. Yeah, the question is, uh, do you have a hot swap disk and I, am I able to detect which disk has died? Um, the answer is I have hot swappable, hot swappable disk, but uh, it's easier for me to take down the, the host, to manage the host, to see the serial, and even uh, list the serial identifier and, uh, and do it like this, because we are at home, not at... Uh, a data center, we can do whatever we want. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what's my uh, this usage? This is a question. I have. Um, it wasn't uh, shown. It's like more or less two terabytes. More or less. Uh, sorry? Ah, for logs, only logs. No logs are uh, rotated, so I don't keep them. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm out uh, of uh, time, but if you want to ask me a question, I will be around. I will stay here for the rest of the day, so you can ask me anything. Thank you.